Uh, now uh, we are welcome. Uh, we are welcoming um, EPOC students, Lina, Marina, Ale, and Juan Carlos, please. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the the, auth the authors here present for their exposition. Thank you very much for your presence here. Uh, we are part of Epoch, and we are we are pleased to to provide a series of exploring act alternatives based on uh, the work of our of our uh, authors and the ex the exposition we have received throughout this uh, this very interesting very interesting uh, hours. Uh, to begin with, we're going to start with an article by author Rafael Groman. Uh, Groman, sorry, if, sorry, my uh, mispronunciations. Not just platform, nor cooperatives, worker-owned technologies from below. This is an art article based on a long-term action research and interviews, field visits, participatory and public scholarship, mainly conducted in Brazil. Uh, it's about platform cooperativism, locally contextualized, and cooperativism. Uh, we, we learned through this article that these kind of platforms have the potentiality to provide decent work, self-management, democratic governance, and other social technological practice, practices, meaning the, the creation of new tech or new vision, new, new ways to practice and create technology. However, we also learned, as, as we have learned through, through these expositions, that the main challenges could be like the funding, coordination, and decision-making both within the organizations and uh, with other organizations, as well as the institutional support and the and, and the this issue of co-option that uh, that it's been present in both both works. Um, the article focuses on two main uh, two main organizations, two main co-ops, which is Senoritas Courier and the Homeless Worker Movement. The first one being focused on uh, career services provided by uh, mainly women, uh, by women and the homeless worker movement, which started as the as the biggest one of the biggest uh, housing uh, movements in Latin America, and it's now really really interesting expanded to other regions, including the production of, of their own technology. And they have uh, throughout this article, we learned the cooperation of uh, uh, technological cooperation and knowledge transfer uh, with Senoritas Courier, which is a ni really nice example of uh, inter-platform inter cooperative. Uh, co cooperation. Uh, we learn also, as uh, as we uh, we have seen, uh, there is a really interesting emerging emerging platform cooperativism in Latin America and Brazil. Uh, the creation of new technologies from below, uh, as well uh, these repeated issues of intercooperation, dependency of uh, its main. Um, main, main uh, technology, big, big technology platforms that uh, surround our everyday lives and it's quite hard to, to get out from the practice and idealization of, the, of these technologies and reimagining technology. Uh, through these two examples, we learn of local context activity. Uh, it's really important to take uh, uh, attention to the local context and solidarity, inclusion, autonomy, as well as technology appropriation and intersectionality. Uh, furthermore, uh, we also ha get got our hands into the second uh, second chapter named Solidarity of a uh, really interesting book by Furuse Shoko. Re again, uh, sorry for my mis mispronunciations, in defense of solidarity and pleasure, feminist technopolitics for the global south, which is um, um, using an ethnographic qualitative approach of participatory and collect collect collaborative practices. Uh, we see the uh, the concept of technology of feelings present throughout the work, and it's really important as an axis of uh, reflection and, and analysis. Uh, we mainly focus on uh, uh, tr in, in this chapter in the cooperative Sul Abatu, I mean, uh, based in Costa Rica, as we learn. Uh, they work on these four axes, which is social uh, solidarity economy, digital technologies for development, knowledge management, art and culture for social transformation. So it's uh, pl plenty of areas of work. And 
they focus on, the, the, we learned that the body territory assembled has a really, really interesting technological potential, as well as a feminist approach, inclusion, and transcolarity, and intersectionality. We also learned of really, uh, two really interesting uh, projects by Sula Batsu, uh, which is TICAS, uh, a, training, a training program uh, of, for uh, young women in Costa Rica, which was the, the object of the funding by later Google and the, the whole issue of, uh, of cooptation that we learned about. And we also have feminine hackathons, a uh, series of collaboration and entrepreneurship rather than competition and uh, capital log logic logics. Uh, we learned that the horizontality, solidarity, and collective struggles are really, really, really basic to build these uh, technologies of feeling as well as uh, the to always think and practice love, trust, and deep effective bonds and the micropolitics of relations, which reconfigurate uh, the work dynamics and everyday life of uh, the, the action of Sula Batsu. Um, while we were discussing, we thought that it would be interesting to have a brief setting of the theoretical economic framework that we are talking about within digital uh, platforms and platform economics. Uh, especially for us students. I'm sorry for the ones that I'm enjoying in, other, in this last couple of days if it's a bit boring or repetitive, but I'll try to have it short. And also it would be interesting with the speakers to know how they think that the cases that presented can fit into these three different uh, frameworks and also the limitations that they, they have. Um, so platform economics, as we, as you know, it's an uh, intersection of digitalization within neoliberalism movements. So it's mainly about an updated version of the capitalism as we know. So looking for profits and uh, trying to have lower costs, especially labor costs and transactional costs. Uh, it shapes technology, society, and economy. Uh, having a key having algorithms as a key uh, feature of these platforms and also being you know, neutral and problematic. Uh, we have different forms of platform economics, but trying to uh, talk more about gig economy or platform work platform. So it's the ones that we have uh, independent contractors providing their service and using the platform as an intermediary. Uh, the problems that we already know are related to labor degradation, precarity work, uh, the non-neutral algorithm man management, uh, while some say, say that it brings uh, job creation and also a flexibility of working hours for the work, for the workers. Uh, the critics are m mostly dedicated to this uh, as platforms tries to make the works into tasks and these tax tasks are being unpaid or underpaid. Uh, also the problems around the data user content and in the way that this data is being concentrated to commercial uh, reasons. Also the lack of labor regulation and data protection measurements. Uh, just having a Lina will talk more about the female workers' challenges, but in this paper that we, we have, they select eight different types of female worker challenges. I'd like to uh, talk about algorithm bias, also the flexibility, that the so-called flexibility that these platforms brings. Uh, when we talk about women, it's actually having a more hard work-life balance, considering unpaid care and domestic work and also how the platforms, uh, the gig economy platforms, they also have these customer reviews and discrimination that are affecting more the, the women, the female workers. Uh, following to the second one, platform cooperativism, we have the platform cooperativism as an alternative to the traditional one that we just mentioned. Uh, it's supposed to have better designs in algorithms in a way that it will uh, promote decentralization, democratic co-ownership, co and equitable value distribution. Uh, another characteristic as transparency, communal ownership, and multiple stakeholders. Uh, we have some challenges and critics regarding, as the speakers already mentioned a couple of them, 
but uh, we like to talk about uh, things they are mimicking the gig economy. So it's inside a capitalistic structure. They do need to uh, compete with other uh, platforms, traditional platforms. And it also can have problems with funds and member involvement and not an adequate regulation yet. Uh, in the paper that we have, they say that is neither creating, protecting, or producing a common. Uh, and the third one is the open cooperativism or common-based peer production. It's, uh, it's embedded in the idea to reduce barriers to knowledge exchange in a way that this collaboration and openness can result into a collective repository of the best ideas and the best practice in an open source technology. Uh, mm, they also said that it needs to, to resist to the neoliberal dominance and is not only an economic project, but also a political one. Uh, and also have to tackle a couple of challenges. Uh, for example, concentration of power, conflict, uh, combining hier hierarchy and competition, and com combining these dispersed peer-to-peer -peer initiatives. Yeah. Okay, so I'll build upon what my colleagues have said so far, but from a more gender perspective. And what we've seen so far is that women are under represented when it comes to STEM fields. So only 30 to 40% of the jobs are occupied by women in STEM. And we see this in the case of Tegas as well in Costa Rica. And then we, um, when we see the co-optation of women's empowerment, we see that companies are mostly hiring women um, as diversity or inclusion hires. So it's kind of like, you know, they're using this to, um, as a guise to promote gender equity well, that, uh, while that may not be the case actually. And at the same time, we are noticing that the female experiences are shamed by a lot of intersecting factors such as class, race, nationality, and these add additional bar barriers to uh, women empowerment. And there's a documented case of a, a, a lot of invisibility when it comes to female labor. So, um, again, as we've seen in the case of Costa Rica, they're trying to combat this. Uh, women, gradu uh, female graduates are um, engaging in public art projects. They're uh, mentoring uh, other girls to join STEM-related rel fields or, you know, their community leaders. So they're trying to uh, demystify the stereotypes that come with STEM, but we still have a long way to go when it comes to this. And this brings us to the gendered nature of the work. So even in within platforms, we see that there are certain sectors, like the delivery sectors, there, uh, there's a huge gender barrier over there. So some s jobs are seen as feminine jobs, when, for example, care jobs or teaching jobs, while others are seen as more masculine jobs. And this brings us to the need for more inclusive policies where women need to play an active role when it comes to de the decision-making pro um, processes. And at the same time, we should be promoting um, empowerment through collective action instead of taking a more individualistic approach to it. And uh, this kind of brings us to some reflections and critiques about uh, digital gender platforms. And we are mainly seeing that um, digital gender platforms are replicating gender inequality because they're kind of mirroring the traditional labor market and um, women are thus channeled into lower status and less prestigious positions. And um, at the same time, the algorithms these platforms are using are considered to be gender blind when they should be gender sensitive. So um, again, these algorithms aren't really factoring in the structural differences. Um, that come with being a woman, and women are kind of pushed down to the algorithm, so they don't get jobs as often, or they don't get good work opportunities. So this finally brings us to like public policy design and gender equality. And um, when it comes to public policies regarding digital platforms, we are seeing that um, women are classified, uh, or platform workers are classified as self-employed or independent contractors, so they don't really have social protection or work protection measures. For example, women working on these platforms don't get maternity leaves or, uh, so yeah. 
and at the same time there's a lack of gender disaggregated data on uh, gender platforms so the studies while they do work at a micro level they can't really be replicated at a macro level so this is another one of the problems and i think Haley will continue Okay, so just to, to wrap up and kind of zoom out a bit, um, I'll provide kind of a quick summary from our perspective, which I think is a bit obvious now. We're economic students, and so uh, reading these studies and seeing your studies that take a much more sociological approach have been really interesting. Um, but we do see some parallels with more heterodox forms of economics that we wanted to raise and then also kind of present as a way to ask questions on you know feasibility moving forward. Um, so these cases provide really interesting examples of social provisioning systems systems um, for providing services to different communities in ways that go beyond what we typically consider market approaches for you know purchase and sale of services which tends to happen in many capitalist societies um, the case in Brazil in particular kind of looks at more a non-market based um, approach to that um, secondarily we also see a kind of distance created from forms of commodification um, that tend to happen and particularly in different forms of kind of uh, gender activism, equity um, activism on things like unpaid uh, work, like care work. There's you know some approaches that really kind of push for the need to provide monetary valuation for these types of more social care provisioning that's provided. Um, and you know this uh, these two cases kind of give alternative examples, which are, are really important for, you know, moving away from these more traditional approaches um, that tend to be, you know, we see kind of uh, pushed from a top-down perspective from tech companies, from development actors as well. Um, but I think the, the question that this leaves for me and what um, our two guests uh, also kind of alluded to is, of course, there's a need for regulation and kind of uh, policy to enable these alternative forms of platforms and of use of technology. Um, but my question would be, where are kind of the limits from a public policy perspective? And is, you know, how do we enable this from more of a paradigm shift as well in, you know, thinking about the ways that technology is used? Um, and then the, the challenges, I think, have also been well described here. Um, and my kind of reflection from hearing you both speak is that these are all really challenges you know, that come as a product of the broader kind of ways that technology is organized and that our economies are organized. Um, and we see how that kind of proliferates even in cases where people are trying to disconnect from that. Um, and so when we talk about tech ownership, um, the, the cases really provide examples of partial ownership in that, you know, you can kind of own the, the platform that you've created, but will you ever really be able to own the, the tech that goes into, uh, you know, collecting and storing your data or the use of WhatsApp as well was the case in Brazil. Um, so there's, you know, these big tech elements have become necessary evils with implications, of course. Um, and then something that was also evident to us through the Costa Rica case that was interesting, and maybe we can talk about it as well, is you know this downward pressure that is created by particularly developmental imperatives, financial inclusion imperatives, and things, um, which really kind of trickled down into the the worker experience or what it seems like from the quotes that you provided, Feruza, um, and you know it it creates some questions of the genuine intersectionality um, when you know people have to make choices to work in these cooperative systems with their own kind of financial economic um, limitations and how can such platforms ensure that they're not themselves kind of imposing these dynamics on their employees because you know the people that maybe have some savings are much more likely to be able to work in a cooperative setting um, you know that loses funding every uh, so often so these are kind of some elements that I think were were really evidenced through your cases and that maybe we can talk about as well because you know it again kind of points to that need for a broader paradigm shift I'm sure we're running short on time, so maybe we can shift to um, a discussion. We've provided some questions that we were thinking through as we read these pieces. Um, and, you know, I think more broadly, we can discuss the implications of de-westernizing the concept of platform cooperativism, as we have seen evidenced in these cases. Um, as Marina had mentioned, how can we or can we not fit these case studies into the three typologies of cooperativism or platformization? 
that's a word I made up. I don't think that's what's used in the, the cases themselves, but how can we fit those in or how can we not? Um, and then also how to maintain this bottom-up style approach when big tech remains so omnipresent in everything that we do. Um, and then also kind of a step back um, to, you know, co-option from uh, the perspective of top-down implications of, you know, what is gender inclusion to what is genuine inclusion. Um, Juan, maybe you can uh, describe that question a bit better, but we kind of see these two terms used um, in different kind of one in a more pejorative and one in a more positive, but what really are the differences when you get to creating um, you know, a cooperative style system? Um, so yeah, those were some questions we had. Thank you so much for having us and thanks to the speakers for um, your research. So yeah. Yeah, maybe we can start. Uh, first of all, thank you for engaging with our uh, articles. Um, maybe I, I can talk for Firuzi uh, as well. Uh, for us, it's really interesting when you you see your uh, uh, work read from also other perspectives. Sometimes we, we lost <laughs> what we wrote some years ago. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk about like wh some of these questions. Uh, the first is about de Westernizing or all this uh, concept. Uh, three uh, um, authors recently published an article in International Journal of Cultural Studies. Um, Mark Steinberg, Lin Zhang, and Rahul Mukherjee called uh, platform capitalisms in plural and platform cultures, especially focused on platform economies in Japan, India, and China. And it is it, it's interesting for me, I, I have to move to Canada in order to understand more uh, Indian, Chinese, and South African economy than in Brazil. It's like uh, 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 crazy for me <laughs> being from Brazil. Uh, and this means that uh, there's not only one platform capitalism, there's not only one platform cooperativism. Um, and sometimes, and Firuz and I were, were talking that yesterday with other uh, uh, people, uh, sometimes in, in academia we, we feel that, okay, uh, there's one person, I, I can't summarize this in a more U.S. perspective, uh, and now even like my Canadian colleagues, they call you, uh, um, people from North, for the United States as U.Sers. So I can talk that as U.Sers. They they study like a small city and they try to generalize like a global perspective based on this small city in the U.S. And sometimes we live in 11 million uh, citizens, uh, cities like Sao Paulo, and we have to provide, oh, why you are so particular or why you are so regional or why some regions of the world are considered global and others are considered local. So when we're talking about the westernizing is is more about pluralizing the ways of knowledge and the ways uh, uh, people are living and not only uh, putting normative principles on it. Uh, I mean, uh, principles are important, like design justice principles or, or a lot of these principles we are discussing, like care work or something. But the way these principles we put in practice will not fit never. Because it's impossible to have like all these principles when you, 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 there will be, always will be inconsistent between the principles and the everyday practices because this is the kind of contradictions or, uh, or the way or out of order or incomplete ways to fit with it. Um, another issue I'd like to, to respond is about dependency. And uh, when I talk about autonomy and or sovereignty, uh, for me, it's useful to think dialectically with dependency. Uh, I didn't talk too much about uh, 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 like homeless working movement. It was an example. I will talk a little bit more because they are not here uh, today. But uh, in, in short, homeless worker movement would like to 
to create technologies, but sometimes they fall uh, under, and sometimes they feel this in a strategic way, using some big tech infrastructures, and, and or they would like to refuse to use Amazon infrastructure, but sometimes they have to use it, and there's this kind of contradictions. Uh, I don't want to put that as a kind of, okay, you are being uh, a false with your ideology. This is not that way, because this is the way people have to deal with it in their everyday practices. And they do choices in relation to their resources uh, uh, as well. But uh, um, sometimes, uh, David Harvey has a, a good phrase, maybe it will be my next tattoo, uh, that contradictions has the problem, uh, they don't resolve. Like, uh, it, it, it's difficult to resolve the, 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 this contradiction. Okay, and now we have the solution for this contradiction. They are there um, and they coexist uh, with this uh, uh, dilemma. Uh, in, in Tiempo Argentino example, uh, from Argentina newspaper, they received a fund from Google as well. And uh, they said, okay, we had to ask fund for Google, but we know that was not the best one for us. And after they, they, they promised to create a technological tool for a newspaper, and they say, Rafael, this technology does not work. We are not using this, this technology. So they are trying, and sometimes they fall in this, in this issue. And also, uh, um, I'm trying to understand what dependency means also. There's a lot of uh, uh, studies talking about platform dependency, like dependency on infrastructures, dependency on funding, dependency on uh, de workers depending on platforms to survive or platform markets. There are different levels of it. But um, I'm writing an article about it right, right now. Not right now, because I was paying attention for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, on exactly how platform studies are not theorizing sufficiently about what dependency is. They are taken for granted that is only one meaning of dependency. So I'm trying to uh, uh, revisit Marxist theory of dependency from Latin America as well, especially for uh, not considering like that, like how Latin America uh, uh, is now a platform dependent capitalism uh, with over uh, exploitation and with all this international division of labor revisited right now but especially thinking of another topic maybe paola will talk this later is about the global production networks of data work of the the labor behind ai and how especially latin america remains uh, a dependent uh, a region of the world, or when we are talking about Hollywood writers fighting for their uh, AI uh, uh, agreements, and how this affects voice actors in Latin America in different ways. So, uh, understanding this in a more geopolitical way as well. And this is the importance also to think about ways of intercooperation. Maybe this is one of the challenges as well. Maybe we're not emphasize too much, but maybe this will be clear during the day. Uh, the needs of more intercooperation effort, like between sectors in, and inside and within same sectors in different regions of the world. Like last week or something, um, uh, a worker from St. Rita's Joaquin was asked by in one of these online events, uh, are you doing some cooperations beyond Latin America? And our response was, yeah, we are going to Paris. <laughs> Uh, with our like with our committee uh, and we like to uh, is like continue this kind of inter cooperation for me this is one of the challenges in order to create like a strong network uh, of organizations or like a coalitions of of like I between researchers and and uh, co cooperatives and social movements as well can I see the questions <laughs> no, I okay. Just five minutes. So yeah. So um, briefly, since uh, Rafael talked mostly about the, the westernizing, is it possible to maintain bottom-up style? 
Uh, that's a difficult, these are good questions, huh? This was great, I have to tell you, it was fantastic. I am so excited about your presentation. Um, so uh, yes, I think we can, and I think that is not the world we activists aspire to, though. I think this is one of the tensions we were talking also about yesterday with the feminist activists I work with and collaborate with. It's always this tension between uh, you know, w w uh, the world we live in and, and what we have to do to live, survive, and thrive in the world we live in with the things we have and the things we need that many times are part of these, many, many times of these capitalist forms of uh, a production and exploitation and dispossession at the same time that we are trying to work for and imagine and work for another, a different world. So it's, we are constantly in that kind of, uh, and feminist activists are constantly in that bind. And again, it's an, it's an unresolvable contradiction. I don't think it's something, it's eventually when that world comes, which, which it will, I am sure it will, uh, then we can have a different kind of conversation. Um, and, you know, that's a great question, co-option, co-optation and inclusion. I think the thing with co-optation is that it's very evident that it is something negative. Uh, and so we know it, we recognize it, and um, although uh, there's a black feminist, I really, really love her work, Mariam Kaba, who always says, I don't care about co-optation, we will always be inventing new stuff, let them co-opt, let them co-opt, because we are so imaginative and so rich that we will always have new things, so just let them co-opt. That's one position, but I do think that the difference is mostly, it can also be discursive, right? Co-optation is always something that we usually feel is negative, we know is negative. Uh, inclusion is a more uh, complicated concept, right? Because inclusion is something that is many times mostly posed as something generous, uh, you know, something sympathetic, something we all strive for. Um, and uh, what I'm saying, which not only me, this issue of refusal is something that has been practiced and theorized by many marginalized, particularly black and indigenous uh, activists and scholars, um, but what I'm saying is that these, these, this inclusion is what kind of inclusion is the one that is being, we are being called upon to be included in what? So it's this kind of, we, I don't think we question enough uh, inclusion because, we, because it is framed always as something generous, as something good for us. Um, so I think that's kind of the conversation with all its contradictions and conflicts and problems. I think that's the, con uh, uh, the conversation we have to have. And this issue about refusal, it's not as someone I think told me, so you're saying people need to be disconnected. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that refusal brings always other imaginaries, brings always other practices. When we refuse, we create, and that's uh, generative refusal, right? That, that is, I think, the direction, and I do think that solidarity in its practices, pleasure, joy, centering this, I do think those are also forms of refusal. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs>